Hi everyone and welcome to Rum Runner Dan's. I'm Dan Genovese and today we're making a tiki classic, The Hurricane. So the hurricane is a drink that comes right onto the scene in New Orleans in about the 1940s, right after the end of Prohibition. So in order to really understand the drink, and before we really get into it deep, we actually have to back up a little bit and we have to talk a little bit about Prohibition. Um, because that really influenced not just this drink, but quite a few drinks, especially tiki ones. So Prohibition was actually a law passed that really limited the sale and buying of alcohol. It didn't talk about the consumption of alcohol. And to be honest, a lot of American whiskey makers, well, I shouldn't say a lot, there were a couple whiskey makers that stayed around and they used to be able to sell their product legally because a doctor could prescribe somebody uh, whiskey as a medicinal use. So whiskey was still being sold during Prohibition and consumed, um, although it was legal because it was considered to be medicine. So because of that, we know that at least some of the whiskey producers were around during Prohibition, but broadly that wasn't the case. Right before Prohibition started, um, a lot of rich people went out and they bought massive amounts, literally whole stores or warehouses even, of all different kinds of booze, scotch, gin, you know, everything they can get their hands on. And they kind of were hoarding it until Prohibition ended. But most Americans couldn't do that. So during Prohibition, people were drinking things that were known as <laughs> rock gut whiskey or things that were just straight out poison. Some of it was like formaldehyde that was filtered down. Um, also industrial strength uh, alcohols, which by the way, are not safe to drink at all. Um, they were cut down with some water and then added juniper oil and they called that gin. Um, kind of makes you think when you turn your nose up at uh, a, a drink that comes to you and you're like, oh, that's only Tangeray or Beef Eaters. It's not some really, really expensive $75 bottle that's overpriced. Anyway, bottle of gin. I'm not drinking that. People were literally drinking things that could have killed them during Prohibition. So why am I going on about Prohibition here? Well, when it ended, a lot of different bars wanted whiskey. Problem was, is it was in short supply. The only ones that stayed around that were American distillers that did it legally anyway, um, were the ones that sold it to pharmacies in order to be sold to people as medicine. So that was very few. And then also the rest of the whiskey that you were getting, Canada, you have to reestablish it. And you had to get the things over from England and it had to go through customs, had to get checked in. Then it had to get distributed through the throughout the country. Remember again, this is 1930s. So you're taking it by boat, going in ports and going from ports to railroads and then out to the public. And it took a long time to do that and reestablish it. So what ended up happening there? Whiskey takes a long time to come over. Uh, there's not many whiskey producers in the United States for distribution. And basically liquor distributors had a flood of rum. Why? It was coming from the Caribbean and it's fast to get to the United States. It's much quicker um, to get rum from the Caribbean into the United States than it was to get Scotch or Irish whiskey um, over from England, Scotland, Ireland and get it over here. Um, and sometimes even we were getting some Scotches that had to first go from England, Scotland down to the Caribbean islands and then through. So we couldn't really get whiskey quick enough. But that didn't stem America's appetite towards whiskey when Prohibition was repealed. They really, really wanted whiskey. And the liquor distributors knew it. So they put a little tax. That means every time that you bought a case of scotch, you had to buy a case of rum. They got rid of all this rum that was taking up room. It was dirt cheap, so people kind of just viewed it as a little tax. It wasn't too expensive. It's actually the reason why Don the Beachcomber's restaurant that he opened up, Don the Beachcomber, 
in California was so successful. The rum that he was buying wasn't bad quality. It was good quality rum. It was just way cheaper than he can get any other spirit at the time because everything else had to come from a different country and the Caribbean was cheap rum. Um, cheap is in price, but high in quality. So with that, you have a lot of, let's take this back now to the hurricane. We're gonna go into New Orleans, great city, home of Beach Bum Berry, Latitude 29, and actually the original home of Don the Beachcomber. Um, so French Quarter, hugely popular across the country, Mardi Gras, you know, even in non-Mardi Gras times, you go to the French Quarter, rich history, real big melting pot of people, tons of history that goes all the way back to the American Revolution and before that. So why am I bringing up New Orleans with a tiki drink? Well, Pat O'Brien's, which is an Irish pub, loved their scotch and they love to serve scotch drinks. However, they got stuck with the same thing after Prohibition that everybody else did. They had to buy a lot of rum. So what happens when you have to buy a lot of rum? You gotta come inventive and think of a way to get rid of it. So Lewis Culligan, who was the head bartender at Pat O'Brien's in the 1940s, came up with an idea. He's like, I got an idea. We're gonna take some of this rum, I'm gonna mix up a drink. It's gonna be three ingredients. It's gonna be lemon juice, passion fruit syrup, and then we're gonna put in rum. Mix the three of them together and put it to in front of everybody. What are we gonna call it? Uh, hurricane. And that actually is how the hurricane started. Pat O'Brien's had to get rid of rum and Pat O'Brien's in that bar was the first one to make it, but by no means were they the only one to serve it. After O'Brien started to sell this drink and they realized how quickly they were able to get uh, rid of all their rum, the bartenders talked and then all of a sudden it started popping up on all different menus. One thing that they wanted the drink to do was help them get rid of rum. One thing they didn't anticipate was the fact that it actually became popular and people like drinking it and like the drink. That's why it's still around today. The problem with that is, is once you get a drink that's going, that's serving as a means to an end versus a drink that you're gonna keep on your menu for a sustained period of time, you have to start rethinking a lot about what you put in the drink because how much overhead you're putting into that drink tends to dictate what it is that you really wanna put in and how much. So the first thing is passion fruit syrup was, you know, something that you could come by. Remember, New Orleans is a port town, um, but it's still gonna be expensive and they couldn't get it in the quantities consistent that they could make and sell those drinks on a normal basis. So that's where you see this other ingredient that's really associated with the hurricane, but it's not part of the original recipe. That is fashionola. So fashionola has a primary flavoring in it that is passion fruit. And if you look online, you can get a lot of different one companies that make what they call the original fashionola, or you could actually go and make your own. There's a couple good recipes online for making it. They're not bad. Um, passion fruit definitely is a dominant flavor in it, but the flavor of what it is is really gonna depend upon what else is in the drink. But sadly, just like the Mai Tai, the hurricane, came underneath a huge amount of oppressive evolution for industrialization and making that drink and pumping it out to thousands and thousands of people so they come up with these artificially flavored mixes. So if you go to Pat O'Brien's today and order a, a hurricane, sad to say I wouldn't do it. So really what we're gonna make today is an authentic, original hurricane, which has only three ingredients, which is almost unheard of in a tiki drink. Almost all tiki drinks have at least five ingredients in them. I, there's very, very few of them that have less than that. This is one of them. So with that, again, we're gonna use a drink mixer. Um, reason why I'm gonna use a drink mixer in the 1940s, it's very possible that Pat O'Brien had this there. These were popular in the 30s. So let's go ahead and get started. Least expensive, most expensive ingredients. So the first thing we're gonna start out with is two ounces of fresh squeezed lemon juice. Okay. Next, we're gonna use two ounces of passion fruit syrup. All 
right. Last part of this is rum. So remember, rum in this case was plentiful, so they wanted to use it. Um, and the original drink, according to Beach Bum Berry when he documented this, was a dark Jamaican rum. Um, when you look at Martin Rebecca Kate's book, Smuggler's Cove, um, in, in there they give you a rating system that you can put like rums together in a better way than just by their color and more around their flavors. So. Uh, a different option uh, that you can go with if you want to get a dark Jamaican rum, I don't want you to go out and buy an Appleton 12 year and put it into the drink, only because I think Appleton 12 year served better in different drinks. This one might not be the best one to pour four ounces of rum into. Um, two of them that come to mind that are Jamaican rums that work really well. Blackwell's, um, if you can find it, I'm having a little bit of trouble finding that right now. Um, was available for a while, now I can't find it. Um, so there's that one. Uh, Blackwell's is one. Another one is Karuba. If you can get Karuba, just use that. That's good stuff. Um, alternatives that you can use. Hamilton 86. So Hamilton 86 rum works perfect. So is Lemon Heart 1804. That also works really good. And no, those aren't the two of the 151 varieties. Those are their regular Demerara rums. Um, uh, also, if you really want to get a dark Demerara and use it, I, I think a you know uh, El Dorado Eight Year would also work really good. I wouldn't use the Twelve in this drink again. I think that's overkill for the drink. Um, so, but I love Demerara in this. So I'm actually using a primarily Demerara rum here, and I'm actually using one that's a little bit on the stronger side. So this is uh, um, Denison's. Uh, vatted dark rum, and actually I love it because on the the um, the cover of this one they have some artwork on it. The artwork is really nice. Denison, love this company. Heard me talk about them uh, probably a bunch on the show already. Uh, this vatted dark is an 80/20 blend, so it's an 80% of dark um, Guyanan uh, rum or Demerara rum. Uh, it's the same thing, and then 20% of rum agricole. So, which is interesting. I think it brings something nice to this drink that you don't normally get when you're just putting through a single rump. So I like this blend. For this drink, you need four ounces. So with my jigger, that's two pours. If you actually have a four ounce measuring jigger, please message me because I would love to see that because to me, that's a measuring cup, but I would love to see somebody who actually made that. All right. So those are the three simple ingredients that go into this drink. Now we need ice. So I like to follow the method that's put in Martin and Rebecca Kate's book. So because uh, I'm using the drink mixer, two of my six ounce scoops here, so 12 ounces of crushed ice, that goes in. Next, grab myself a couple of my ice cubes here in my crack. Just knock that across the floor. My puppy, Pepper Ann is her name, uh, loves it when I crack ice and it goes all over the floor because she goes and grabs it and then starts crunching on it. It's really funny. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to flash blend this for four seconds. All right. Now, for the glass here, what are we going to serve this in? So the glass we're gonna serve this in today is what's known as a, often known as a hurricane glass. Um, yeah, yeah, you can call it a hurricane glass, also called a squall glass. Um, you can serve a lot of different things in here. Um, I particularly like this one. I will send a link to this particular glass. It's a little bit thicker and a little bit heavier. I've, I had some in the past that were a little thin. I, I try to stay away from thinner glasses only because that they break so easy and I, I'm a little worried about breaking them. So, uh, squall glass, um, if you don't have this, just get yourself a big Pilsner glass, that'll work too. Um, still tastes the same, promise. All right. All right, so now we need to garnish our drink here. So. If you watched my show, you know, you know that I'm not a big fan of umbrella drinks because I'm just not. Um, but this drink, I make an exception because it actually is fitting. 
to have an umbrella in here and I'm going to show you why and this might make sense why I actually like it. So I just like to grab myself a nice piece of uh, dehydrated fruit. Uh, there's, I'll put a link that you can get some good quality ones. Um, they, I don't believe that they're on Amazon, um, but I'll double check for you guys. Um, but that's okay. Um, they're a good company. Uh, also, it's if you don't want to sit around and, you know, make it yourself for, or, you know, for six hours and put something in your oven at a low setting and just chill out and spend all that money on gas um, or electricity, whichever your oven is. So I'm just going to top this drink off here a little tiny bit with some ice. All right, garnish. So we take our little rubber band off our umbrella. Like I said, this will be the only time you'll see me use one of these. Um, then I got to open it up. Okay. And underneath there's a little tiny thing, just like a normal to pop it up. And there's a little tiny rubber band on the bottom that helps hold it up. So what you want to do is push it all the way up like that. Grab it, crush it, bend it over, make it all mangled, nasty looking, right? Then you put that in the drink. Now you know why I like putting this in the drink. Because <laughs> I don't really enjoy these. But for this purpose, I'll make an exception because you destroy it. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. Oh, need a straw. Here. Hang on. Um, so you need a good size straw. So I'm actually going to use something here that I think is fitting in a hurricane. Whenever you see a nasty storm at sea, you always see a giant octopus or squid coming up. So I'm gonna pick out my straw Thulu. Um, these are from Surfside Sips. Again, link below you uh, to pick those up, or if you go to surfsidesips.com, use code RUMRUNNER20, you get 20% off your order. Now, let's see here. We're gonna grab ourselves one of our wood row coasters. Put that guy right here. Put that up, and there you guys have it. The original Pat O'Brien's 1940s Hurricane. Let's go ahead and give it a taste. <laughs> oh, that's a good drink. It's a good drink. Here. So if you like tropical fruit smoothies, tropical fruit juice, that kind of stuff. You are gonna love this drink. The, the first thing is the rum does flavor the drink. It's not the dominant flavor. As you can tell, there the lemon juice, two ounces of that, and two ounces of passion fruit syrup, which is, passion fruit is pretty strong flavor. Um, the two of those together, you're getting that brightness. So the way I like to describe passion fruit is it's a bright, sharp flavor so it's a it brightens up a drink so you can taste it and you're like ooh tropics but it's sharp so it cuts out other things so it helps to cut out some of the sweetness uh the lemon comes in and kind of downplays some of the sugar content in here but then what it does is you still are able to taste and this is why you want a dark rum in this you want something that's strong that can stand up to the rest of the, the ingredients in this drink that it still comes through. And that's why I like this Dennis in here. And that's why I like a little bit of the rum agricole because you get that little bit of grassiness from the agricole rum. And uh, as always, you get that oakiness that comes through from the Demerara rum in here. So it fantastic drink, um, a great, great drink for you guys to make. Hey, you know, it's right now, it's the beginning of the new year in 2021, um, and Mardi Gras is coming up, and when it comes up, why don't you give it a, a chance here and have uh, an original hurricane with it and celebrate Fat Tuesday. Um, that's it for me today, everyone. Please, please like and subscribe uh, to our channel. Really looking forward to bringing you more drinks uh, over the coming weeks. So until next time, everybody... Akole Maluna. Yeah. See you guys next time.